think the problem is people try to get everything perfect in the yeah. first I mean imagine doing a painting and expecting that the thing that you had to do is have the painting complete Hello and welcome to Art Juice. This is honest, generous and humorous conversations that will feed your creative soul and get you thinking with me, Alice Sheridan. And today I am joined by another fabulous guest uh, who recently came into the Connected Artist membership to share all his wisdom on YouTube, getting started on YouTube, uh, YouTube for artists, what we can do, what we're worried about. And I thought it would lovely be lovely to open the conversation up and to have another chat with you guys all listening in. So thank you for being here again today and welcome, Matt Hughes. How's your day been? Amazing. Tiring. I'm, I'm running a conference soon, so I'm uh, stressing out about all of those things. Well, as I say stressing out, but I don't really know what stress is anymore. Um, my life is definitely not as stressful as it used to be. Um, What's more stressing me out, Alice, is I've just seen how many episodes you've done of this podcast. Oh, my God. How impressive is that? Can you imagine never starting it? Here you are, 250 plus. Can you imagine never starting it? That's amazing. I know. It's a, it is a very good lesson, actually, in just getting started with something before you're yep. even ready. Because And just getting started with something on a trial basis to kind of see how it goes, which is exactly how we started. When Louise and I began, and those of you who've been listening to us for a long while never believe this when I say it, we didn't know each other. We weren't friends. We hadn't had loads of conversations. It was an idea. And we said, well, let's try it and see how it goes. And I know that lots of you have been listening from the beginning or have gone right back to our first episodes. Our first episodes we recorded with Apple iPhone headphones. Amazing. From six years ago. So the sound quality was appalling, no doubt. But it doesn't seem to have done us any harm. So that's maybe quite an interesting thing to kick off, off with. But hang on, before we get into that, can you tell everybody a little bit about what does a usual week look like for you? What do you do? How do you help people? Where can people find you? Because it's nice to know that before we kind of get into the conversation. Okay, great. So not a lot of people know this. Uh, <laughs> it, it started to become more common knowledge. Uh, but I actually have a full time job. Yeah. Um, and so a normal week, like for me, looks very weird because I'm constantly on that juggle. And I think actually probably a lot of your listeners are in the same boat yeah. of ju juggling what is their well-paid or reasonably paid job yeah. and trying to do their paid. passion, to, trying to do their passion thing, right? Yeah. Like that, like for me, the YouTube stuff, the conference um helping people start channels and doing live stream stuff and all that kind of stuff is is definitely where my passion lives and I had a video company for like seven years but even when I had that that was a side hustle I had five staff and it was still a side hustle I was still working a full-time wow. job I could just never really give this I'm an IT contractor so I could never really give it up uh, it was a good amount of money every month and we could never really get to that point where we could just flip over to like it's enough for me to to be paid to quit my day job um so so I think that's what's what's normal for me I want to quit that by the end of this year so hopefully this this episode I'll be able to come back in a year's time and listen to it and go Matt you were right you did what you said you were going to do but I love that though for two reasons firstly the fact that you can do something extra and even though you said at the beginning like you're not that stressed I mean it's, that feels like a lot to juggle and fit into your time are you yeah. just really good at managing your time and being clear with your boundaries um no De I mean you ask my wife she'll definitely say no Alice so, okay. so not at all but um like for me stress I I've worked been lucky enough to work from home for uh, way before the pandemic so a lot of the jobs that I got were sometimes hybrid and sometimes working from home yeah. so I worked for the NHS um in in uh, Stafford and worked for I went there on the first day and picked up my laptop and then I worked from home for eight months after that um worked for the Welsh government and I, I used to go to Cardiff two days a week as a hybrid um uh, situation um 
but for me, the last contract I had before the pandemic was working for Next and I, I worked in their offices and it was only in Leicester. It's the first contract I had in Leicester. Mm-hmm. I was so happy to get something close to home. But what it meant is that I was in their offices five days a week. And when I'm in someone else's office, I have to put up with all the crap that comes with all the small talk, all <laughs> the, you know, office all politics, you know, oh they're just oh it's just so awkward I just really didn't like it I don't fit in very well you know I'm trying to do all my other stuff I would do meetings and guest expert sessions live streams in like the offices that I'd borrow (laughs) and just hope that nobody came in because I didn't book them I just sat in there and every now and again I had to leave a room because 10 people came in you know um so that to me was stress yeah like being in that environment was stress and so then to go through lockdown and and come and be in my office I've got this lovely office upstairs it used to be the kids playroom it's only eight foot by nine foot yeah um but when I feel like overwhelmed I will go downstairs and play on my xbox for yeah. half an hour yeah or and I do that at the weekends as, as like my sort of downtime so I've got a really good balance of knowing when to work and work hard I mean even when I play Xbox I'll build a website at the weekend whilst I'm playing on my Xbox like that doesn't feel like work to me it's just something that I can do at the same time but that's the goal right isn't it doing something that doesn't feel like work and I think you're right there are a lot of people who will be listening to this and feeling like you know the fact that maybe they're managing another job or that they've got something that is reliable and regular income somehow means that what they do for passion for enjoyment for creativity you know, one doesn't have to fill the space of the other. And it, it's just so interesting when we think of, you know, what we what we take the things that we enjoy and when we turn them into a job that suddenly has to become all, all things to us, it changes the nature of our responsibility and our relationship yeah. with that. And But I do think it's interesting that, th- you know, that thing of, uh, you know what do you actually really enjoy spending your time doing where you don't keep track of hours and where you are happy or you're doing it just because you're interested or you want to bring people along on the journey with you and I remember when I first started you know building my art business and doing things like teaching myself web design and now I encourage other artists to do things like track their studio hours but it's not as a self-judgment thing. It's just so that you can understand your process a bit better. But what I've never encouraged people to do, and I would hate to do it for myself, would be to track the amount of hours that I spend around that, making it yeah. all happen. Because that's in a way, in my head, that's not really the thing. Like the thing is the thing. And then there's just all these other place things that we put into place to bring the thing to life you know yeah I think and and so and and this is why like for me when I think about playing Xbox at the weekends I always have that guilt right it's something I enjoy right. doing it's not work and I should be earning money and all that kind of stuff even though it's a weekend or whatever um I do it and I think I probably do work at the same time just to kind of convince myself that something's happening um but also I think it's about managing the tasks like I know I can do a website whilst I'm playing Xbox or do some follow-ups for my sales it's not high value stuff and it's just stuff that I need to do that's a that I know I might get over a a weekend three or four hours of solid work but it's split across those two days yep um versus if I'm sat there and I know right today's you know it's working hours I come in the office and I go and sit down and do those things like so I'm just okay with finding the tasks that are not so high pressured and high priority that I can just yep. do it and and like I say I feel like I'm doing something then at least yeah and I'm just not precious about it but also I think the other part of all of it is that I have a really great social life not in turn I don't have many friends or anything like that I've got um, one one really good friend and my wife it's probably as far as my friends go which I'm also have very happy with by the way um don't you know some people have like 10 girlfriends that they all go on holiday with or a load of lads that I don't I don't get I don't work yeah. well in those situations 
um but we do loads of things so i've got like five festivals this year we go to theater we go to loads of gigs like my, every month throughout the year pretty much there's something going on we're going to see sister act this weekend um you know so i so i fill my life with stuff because i i really enjoy those things yeah. and so again i when i'm sitting here um and i'm in meetings for four hours i can just go when I'm going to see Sister Act at the weekend. And it's not an escape from the life. Yeah. It's more that it's a reward. Like, you know, we're going to a nice restaurant as well. My wife's just finished a course and she's just qualified as a, a mental health coach for children. So it, it's like a celebration for us as well. Yeah. But we'd have probably done it anyway because we were going down to London yeah. and we thought we would do it. But um, it's just doing all of those things. I think when you can mix it all up, uh, how how can my life feel stressful? I don't, I don't see that. And... Um, that's why when I said I was stressed at the start about my conference, I'm like, you're not really, are you? <laughs> you know, everything seems to be going all right. Like, I, I don't know what it should be like or what it shouldn't be like. It's our first one. So we just. Yeah, it's going to be good. I think. Just roll with it. Yeah, but I do think I do appreciate it, though, because it's the side that I think often people don't talk about. And yeah. um, I think that's what you know, that's what we try to do here is kind of like talk about how the week's going you know lumps and all all the good bits all the bit all the real bits like and there is quite a lot of stuff it doesn't matter what area you're working in where people are like oh it needs to be done this way or you should be doing this or you should be doing that and it can start to feel quite stressful so I think finding that kind of balance where your life is busy but fulfilling and yeah excited and you're following your passion so let's move on to how YouTube fits into this for you who do you help with with youtube um so somebody asked me the other day what my niche was and that's yeah. probably one of the first things you pick up when you when you do social media oh, but i, I don't that question i don't have a niche um yeah I, my, my uh, list of clients goes from artists to um uh, needlework people to coaches career coaches uh, um bricks and mortar businesses like it, it's just really so varied I, I think the the way I kind of describe it now is I always say heart-led entrepreneurs because I mm -hmm. like to work with people that actually care about their suppliers mm -hmm. uh, it's really funny when you do work for someone you really get to see the real side of uh, their being um when you're a supplier yeah. for them so I like to I like to work oh, with I people that... oh oh I bet there's some stories in there <laughs> yeah there is I don't want to talk about it though okay Alice, um, no I you know I I think you so we used to do a done for you service for YouTube yeah. where they would film the videos and send them to us and then we would edit them mm -hmm. um and send them you know all the publishing and everything but we don't do that service anymore okay. and we don't do that service because I didn't have nice people that I worked with so I just decided right. I won't do that anymore um so now I just now I just and and that's the other thing right like we we decided to do that service we tried it. We went for a specific niche, which was like speakers and coaches. Mm -hmm. And we just found that it the, the ego was too much with that group of people. That's not to say all speakers and coaches are like that. Um, but it's just the ones we happen to choose. I think we made some bad calls on it. Um, and it's just OK. We just stopped doing it. You know, yeah. like we just decided that we were going to stop doing it. Nobody came in and said, Matt, you said six months ago you were going to do this thing. I just try it and think and see if it works like the there's no bad side of trying something and it not working you, you just fail and move on don't you you learn something from it yeah um, so now I focus on like teaching people really and, and showing them and giving them the skills to go and do the thing and I think like if you think of uh, artists and classes where you're teaching students how to become better artists it's the same thing YouTube is a, a largely creative and technical thing yeah. And it's the technical thing that most people lack the skills in. So they'll come to me and say, I don't know what camera to use. I don't know what mic to use. I don't know how to come up with ideas for um, my channel. Um, and they'll say all these things to me. And it, 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 although I'm a mentor, so I tell them what to do, go and get this camera, go and do that thing. I also do a lot of coaching around yeah. how they, and I'll give you one example because we were talking about it earlier is um, I, I tell people not to film videos when they're in low energy. Yeah. So we're doing this, uh, it's half past six. This is my low energy time. It's always the worst time to do a podcast, by the way. So if anyone's sitting there thinking, Matt's really low energy, I'm not, you know, I try to bring the energy, of course, to podcasts. Uh, but it's because it's my low energy time. When I do videos, it's 10 o'clock in the morning 
like 10 to 12, 10 to 12 sort of thing. I, I know that's my high energy time. So I'm like, find that within your being. And I suppose it's the same with artists, right? You you don't right. want to I, I was in the studio anything. this morning at 10.30 because I, you know, I was like, right, I'm going to get there first and get that done Yeah. Um, because that's how I want to start today. So that's why we're doing it at 6, at 6. At six thirty, because yeah, yeah, because that's otherwise the, the day's right? yeah, the day's gone doing things like this, which for me is the kind of it's an admin it's task. Right? This is an admin it's task. It's more than a an bit ad- of marketing. It's more than an admin. I genuinely enjoy it. I love the yeah. fact that we have these somewhat random conversations. Do you know what I really love? And this it get feeds into YouTube. I think I love the fact that as we've done more and you've mentioned that we've got quite a lot of episodes already the ones yeah. that we think or the ones that we plan for or the ones that we like have an idea or like try to make ourselves think of a structure for they're fine it's the ones where they really are more random and maybe we just pitch up or sometimes afterwards we just, you know we might look at each other and go was that any good? Do you think anyone's going to yeah. be interested? And we just think, oh, hell, you know, we'll just, we'll edit it and post it anyway. Those are the ones we get all the messages about. And I'm guessing that the same might be true of YouTube. Oh, it totally is. I, so I did a podcast. I've got a podcast called the YouTube Success Podcast. That's my okay. first pitch of the day. Yeah. Um, and um, I, I've been interviewing my speakers for the conference, right? And um one of them is called Louise Brogan and we sat there a week or so ago and we were doing this episode and we just chatted. And the reason why I interviewed Louise, the reason why I like Louise is she runs a LinkedIn training business. So she's, yeah. she trains all like big corporate companies, but for the last two or three years, maybe since lockdown, all she's been saying on the socials is I keep getting loads of links from um, uh, loads of leads from YouTube Mm-hmm. which is weird because she does LinkedIn, right? You'd think that's the main thing. But what people do is they go and watch her videos, they warm to Louise, mm-hmm. and then, of course, they then follow up and ask to work with her. Um, so we had that conversation. We It was, again, you know, I, I don't prep uh, hugely for my podcast. We just go and talk and I ask some questions. And I got this feedback, and I think it was on the YouTube channel, and it said, well, what was the point in that? You just ch- chatted for 20 minutes. Yeah. And then another comment I got somewhere else was like, oh, that was brilliant. I didn't know you could do that thing. So it's just two completely yeah. like polarizing, po- opposite views. And I think that's what I love about podcasting in general, but also just content because, you know, when you create content that you think, oh my God, that's so obvious. I've, I've seen a hundred people describe how to, you know, do their first, um, you know, drawing or whatever. Why would I do that? Why is anyone yeah. going to watch mine? You'll find someone that watches it and goes, oh my God, I've, this is, I've just never seen it like this before. This is the moment. I've heard this five times, 10 times before. Yeah. This is the moment that it finally landed. Yeah. Um, so, and you just can't guess for that stuff, can you? You just record these things, put them out there and you've got to let someone else decide what's in it for them. And there might be nothing and that's okay as well. Yeah, I think, it's a very interesting balance, I think, between, and I, I run a, um, there's a course that's available all the time. It's called Time to Shine. And it's like a 14 day mini challenges, super short things that people can do. Because I found that within the membership, there were a lot of people coming with like a want or a desire to publicize their art, to share it, to show it. And I think, you know, art making as a practice, it, you know, it's, it's solitary by nature usually it's quite private it can be quite revealing and that I noticed that there was there were a lot of people who were still you know they were hesitant about even showing up on socials like you know what do I post how do I talk about it how do I share and it's just this very interesting balance I think of finding enough confidence to get started having enough understanding about what you do but more importantly why it's important and really recognizing for yourself that the practice of sharing it is going to be as helpful for you if not more helpful for you in terms of what it reveals as the fact that you're concerned about the people watching or who are going to be seeing it you've almost got to disconnect the end result and outcome I think in order to get started a little bit how do you see that with with people that you work with yeah um 
Yeah, I think I agree. As you were saying it, I was thinking about the artists that they love doing art and then they stop for yeah. 10 years and then picking up the paintbrush again was the hardest thing. Even though the skill in their minds never left, it was just hard to start again. It's the same with video. It's the same with any kind of content, really. Any creativity, I think. I bet dancing's the same. You know, you dance, you stop doing it for two years, going again. My wife just started Zumba again after a, a, like six months off and she's like, oh my God, I feel like a slow as anything you know and she looked she was loved it being fast and all that kind of stuff so so it made me think of that but I think you've just got to be selfish you know you you want to do stuff for other people and and actually with me I'm teaching a lot of the time or I'm or I'm trying to show people the way to do stuff in in my own unique way um but you've you've got to be really selfish in just getting stuff out there and doing it for you more than anything else which seems counterproductive. I'll give you an example of it. Uh, we did a um, a virtual summit called Creator Day. So we're doing a two festa conference every six months and Creator Day every six months, like thirteen weeks between each. You're event. gonna do you're gonna do the two fest conference not just once a year, twice a year. Are you? Every every six months. Yeah. Oh, 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 I so the next one's that. in Dublin, by the way, um, which okay. we're gonna tell everyone on the day. But if this comes out before then, everyone will know. It's like the worst kept secret because I'm telling everybody <laughs> about it. Um, it's because I'm so excited to do it in Dublin. I mean, I'm excited about Birmingham as well, but there's just something about Dublin. Um, so so we did the the Create Day and and um I did a wrap up of like the event and just talking about what results were and all that kind of stuff. And I did it live and I showed it on put it on YouTube and stuff, and I just said at the right at the start, like this is totally self-indulgent. I want to look back at this in a year's time. Yes. And and remember where we started. The process. I've got the sun just coming in. I can see it. It's Every time I turn my camera actually. lighting down. <laughs> Good, thanks. It's the golden hour. So, so I just did it, and I said, like, this is uh, this is just for me. It's self indulgent because I just wanted to look back and remember what it what it's like. And I think actually, if you think about all of the things that we create, that we look back in six months' time. Hopefully, not everything we look back in six months' time and goes, oh my god, it's horrendous, because uh, you was you know the six month version of you before yeah. that. You've not learned. You've not practiced all that kind of stuff. Um, Hopefully we're still able to look at it and go, oh, that that was good. I, I did that thing. I'm glad I started. Yeah. Look, look where I am now. Um, and it's hard because when you where you are now, you you're doing it for your future self, right? But you can't. I can't creatively see my pictures, my future self. I don't I know agree. what it's going to be like for my future self. But I know, like with the conference with Creator Day, we have to do the first one. It has to be hard. Yeah, no, that's not fair. It has to be hard. Mm. Yeah, I, th I think. I think. Well, it has I think. To be hard. I think it's a challenge. I think by by its very like the first time you do something, you're not an expert in it. You don't know exactly no. how it's going to go. Whether it's painting or putting together a conference or doing your first video, like it's not going to be your best version of it. You well, can heck, bring yeah. whatever you've got to it and pull together all your strands that you've got so far, but inevitably the next ones are they're going to be better and better yeah. and better and you're going to find your voice and figure out like you say a time of day that works for you and what you want to say and what's the perfect length and all of those kind of things we we are really hard on ourselves on the first versions that we do of things and I, that must hold a lot of people back like I don't I can't get this perfect so I'm not going to bother posting anything or starting anything on YouTube yeah, I, I, honestly, oh my God, I had a membership for a year and we had this one guy that showed up every week. We have a call every Friday um, and he showed up every week and he just never, he never created a video. And I, I would give yeah. him so many strategies and he just wouldn't create it. And yeah. it's just total analysis, paralysis. It's all confidence, all that kind of stuff. And I think that's why I said it ha has to be hard. Like that going from zero to one. Yeah, is the just, hardest bit just feels like the hardest thing and then it, like there's almost like a weight lifting off your shoulder to do it so so now my strategy with people is um when we first meet we like we do a planning session as the first thing but I'm like you're going to create a video this week and they're like what but what about and they'll give me all the excuses in the world yeah. do, do, do you drive Alice yeah so do you remember your first driving lesson e no but I can, I remember, I mean, I remember roughly what it was like, but I've probably blanked out my actual first driving lesson, right? I hated it, right? <laughs> right, well, I, so I remember it. And, and the strange, strangest thing is I, I later in life moved back, like a, a road away from where I started. But I just remember getting in 
and um the instructor got out of the driving seat and I got in it and he was yes. like you go and get in it and I was like what I thought well the first lesson I'm just going to spend all load of time doing theory and he was like nope yeah. <laughs> you're just five minutes later you're driving a car and it was so weird you know and it was so hard and now now when you think about driving you just don't even think about it do you it's like it's like walking walking out the door it's just natural stuff to do you know but it's like when they give you your baby to leave hospital with and you're like what really like seriously you're just gonna oh let my, me oh my god my wife out had, of hospital with a baby my wife had a tear when our first was born and i was 23 and they took her away and left me with a baby <laughs> for 40 minutes oh my, oh my god that felt like my life was and i was like I just remember handing, looking out the door thinking, is she ever going to come back? Because if she don't come, come back, I don't know what to do with a baby. I was yeah. totally reliant on Amy being a superstar, which she was, and she came back, and so that's okay. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, you know, that that first thing, I, I think you just got to sort of rip the Band-Aid off sort of thing, as the Americans say, and, and just get started and, and do it. And so always now, when anyone comes to me, whether it's uh, with YouTube or we do a lot of short stuff, you know, some people will say Matt, I can't do a 20 minute video now. Like I, it's just too much of a big jump. What can I do in the meantime? And so I'm like, let's do a um a short, a YouTube short, or what other people call TikTok reels, right. reels, whatever. Yeah. I get them to do that first. So it's only a minute long and it just gets them kind of thinking and feeling what it feels like to create content in that way. Uh, you talked about those people that find it difficult to show their face for the first time, or um, maybe they do a lot with their hands. Uh, there's a woman I, I know coming to Two Fest called Robin. And she, I think I mentioned it on the call that we had. Um, she just shows her hands and does a lot. And she's got to 780,000 subscribers just with her mm -hmm. hands and her voice. So it can work. You can do it. But I just think there's so much more with the connection that you have with people's faces that yeah. you should, where possible, just bite the bullet and get in front of the camera as weird as it feels the first time just as a as a question so i mean for people who are right at the beginning so there, there's a few things aren't there that let's kind of just dismantle a few of the blocks for people who are right at the beginning or who are thinking about it and then maybe let's talk about like why this should be something that you should consider but like i can imagine like my blocks would be uh, the tech and getting the thing set up is going to be too complicated and it will live on my to-do list for like uh, mm, three, four months, eight months, 12 months, two years, like, and then I will actually do it and think, how do I actually start? And it will take me 10 minutes. What do you actually need to do to get a YouTube channel, like, just started? Uh, you just need your mobile phone. There's, there's nothing else you need and like, just really search nothing. youtube i mean how do you literally just get like just just let people know how easy it can be to just yeah so get so if i describe the steps in in a sort of without going into detail you need a, a google account yeah right so most people have got a google Free. account uh, when i first did that course i had to create a video on how to create a google account because i yep. met someone then didn't you need a google account you go to youtube the, one of the first things it says to you if you go to youtube is do you want to create a channel so yeah. you say yes to that um most of the time now it gets you to create a brand channel so you have a channel and it'll just be like an empty space uh, which is like a white uh, uh, empty uh, uh what's the thing canvas right um and then you can take a video whatever video you've created and upload that straight away um, and that could be your first video. So if you think so about no, it, no editing. So let, let's keep it, let's keep it really I, simple I, to begin with. Totally, totally, yeah. Because mm -hmm. the problem is, you the way you just described it, then you know, I, I'll do it and I'll wait four months because I've not got the right equipment or whatever. Um, <laughs> just to see your thumb look and put it in the corner. Um, it, the way you described it, if anyone's listening on the podcast, uh, Alice put a thumb up and it came up on the screen all the things that you said beforehand they're the things that stop people so when i have the calls and we do like a weekly call and i've got four parts to my program and we do that in in order every month so it's one two three four one two three four one two three four same okay. thing it's planning planning production publishing promotion and it's a flywheel so we just go around because the process with podcasting and youtube is really similar and it just follows that strange thing there's no no difficult strategy with it right 
it's just consistent when, finding your flow isn't it a little bit that's yeah well yeah. everybody just comes up with the normal excuses you know of of what will stop you and and actually when you break it all away and you just say right get your mobile phone out and we you could i could literally do it right straight away and i'll say just tell people about you and what you're going to deliver on your youtube channel so my name is Matt. I do video. My name is King. Of, um, we've got a brand called King of Video. I used to have a video company for seven years. And on this channel, I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to teach you about YouTube and how to make better videos. Um, what if people don't know what they want to put on their YouTube channel? Would Well, you've just got to choose something. Okay. So, what, so what's the so thing? It could be, I'm Alice. I'm an artist in London. And I want to share some of my everyday journeys and trips to the studio what I see and then how it comes up in my paintings yes exactly that yeah so and you and you just when you do that so that let's say that was two minutes long mm -hmm. uh, which two minutes feel, feels like a long time when you first do it but let's just say you did that and if you if you've never done anything like that before a post-it note with three to five bullet points of what you're going to talk about and you just do it and deliver it in that way and then you post it Right. And once it's posted, it's out there, it's done. You don't have to worry about it anymore. Don't think about it. Don't worry if it's perfect. No. First one's done. Yeah. Yeah. And then all we've got to do after that is be 1% better every time. Mm -hmm. So uh, about creating all this stuff is like I make it really easy because I'm a lazy videographer. So like my lights go on and off with one button. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you're watching YouTube, you'll see that. Um. Uh, because because for me the excuses are like if my energy is low I don't want to do the stuff yeah so I create an environment where it's simple and easy and again yeah. that's why I get people to use their phone in the first instance so if you think that you've just got to be one percent better each time then the next time we can worry about like and it might not be that even the next time it might be like five videos later oh uh, the the lighting's not so great or I've I've listened to it back I hated listening to my voice because everyone hates their own voice and um, but it still sounds a bit tinny or there's something going wrong. So I need a microphone. Yeah. So then you get a microphone. And the next time oh, the lighting's not great, I'll I'll go and get um some lights. And and you just do that over time. And I think the problem is people try to get everything perfect in the yeah. first I mean, imagine doing a painting and expecting that the thing that you had to do is have the painting complete before you started. <laughs> like <laughs> Yeah. You can't you can't do that, can you? you? Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. I know you need the materials, but you, you you could just start with the basics, couldn't you, in the first instance, and then improve. Yeah, it. And, and I'm assuming as well that I mean, I there's a lot of in terms of editing. I mean, you could either like if you're a Mac person, you could do it in iMovie, but there's you're keeping it short. There's a lot of apps that you could even you can even edit it on your phone, can't you? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, so I know people, um, obviously, because I'm. A YouTube guy. I spend a lot of time with YouTubers, um, and I know plenty of people that have got to ten thousand or a hundred thousand subscribers, and they only ever use their phone. They haven't. Wow. They edit on their phone. They uh, create the video on their phone. Uh, they do have a few extra gadgets like a microphone, yeah. maybe a bit yeah. of lighting, or, or some kind of um, stabilizer. But it's all done in their phone. I think lighting is really important. Like that's no light. Sorry, that's a YouTube thing here. Yeah. But, you know, it makes all the difference. And yeah. actually, it's so accessible these days, all of that kind of stuff. It doesn't have to be a block or be that expensive. I'm interested in in the best phone editors. What what do people use? Uh, so, uh, so I used to teach on something called InShot. And yes. I used that because it yeah. was available on Android and uh, Apple. Yeah, and I've got a course. It's called Mobile Editing School, and it's um, I'd used InShot on an iPad the whole time. That's the other reason I did it is because I like the fact that it was available on phones and and on tablets. You know, yeah. But the thing that people use now, and it's free, and there is a paid version, is CapCut, which Cap is Cut. interesting. Uh, TikTok's, uh, I think TikTok owns it. Oh, I didn't know that. But it's so good. And it's obviously works on the devices. And if you pay for the pro version, you get all the different styles of captions and transitions. I mean, you know, with very little effort, you can become a really good editor on a on a relatively simple piece of software like CapCut. You know, there's other professional versions of these things, but I don't get people to start anywhere near there. 
And it's interesting as well, because I wonder if things like, you know, the editing that you have now, even within Instagram on Reels, I mean, the, you know, when Reels first started, like I used to use Splice a lot to, to yeah. edit things together. Um, I still have a free version of Splice. That it's very similar to InShot. I find the controls are a little bit bigger. So for when I don't need my reading glasses, like I can yeah. see things a bit clearer. Um, but Actually, I haven't used it for quite a long time because their editing controls within within Reels are actually so good now. And I think that that's helped people maybe play around a little bit more with what they can do with editing and, and maybe break down some of those barriers. I mean, you could even create an Instagram Reel, download it, upload it to YouTube as a short before you've published it. You won't even get a watermark on it then, will you? Yeah, oh, there's there's loads of things you can do. Lots of tricks. Your life easier. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, so eventually, what I get people to do is outsource their editing. So I get them yeah. to film it and then just drop it in a folder somewhere that someone else can pick up and edit it. That's the yeah. real hack because editing's great. It's fun if you're creative, it but fun, it is yeah. a real time suck. Yeah. You know, probably the biggest time suck. If you think if I if I film a 15 minute video to edit that video and make it interesting, it would probably take me an hour or two. Yes, I so, agree. Yeah. Which is insane, really. What well, I've just filmed the thing. I just want to get it out there, you know. But if I um if I put that in a folder for my editors to use and edit, they'll do it ten times better than me and it'll probably cost me twenty, thirty, forty quid. Mm. Um so why would I not get them to do it? I mean, I wouldn't recommend that at the start when you're first yeah. getting started. I always say to people, you want to learn at least. So you know, maybe you've not got as much income this month and you need to do your videos yourself. So at least you know how to do a reasonable edit of them and then things are picking up again. I can outsource a bit more and or whatever the situation may be. Or maybe I'm earning a bit of money from my YouTube channel now so I can, the first money that I earn, I use to outsource the editing because then it means I can create more content rather than editing the content. Why should we be doing things on YouTube and the second part of that sentence is brackets rather than social media. How do the two fit together in your view? So I think I, I compare it to, cause I love music. I compare it to music, right? You, um, you can either go and perform in a small venue. That's a thousand people. Mm -hmm. It's a headline artist cause it's a smaller venue. Or you can go and be a support act for Harry Styles at Wembley Arena. Which one would you prefer to do? And I think performing for Harry Styles in Wembley Arena is probably better for you. Like mm -hmm. you might, you might, even though there's you're the support act and there's only half the stadium, that's twenty five thousand people compared to the thousand that you had before. So that's how I see it as the two things. Now, I will say... Because, is that because of the referral element of the way that YouTube videos... the so audience good, size. So you're talking about... Size. So when you're on social media or Instagram, it's your audience size. And we all know, you know, perhaps what the percentage even of your audience that gets shown your stuff. Whereas what you're saying is when it's on YouTube, because of the way they recommend videos after other videos you're getting well, the potential bigger. the potential is higher yeah yeah okay I mean, you still have to be strategic with all of the content in order to yep. reach the right audiences and all that kind of yep. stuff um but even if you started so a guy i know jerry he said to me on he was on my podcast as well he said uh, i said matt um how are you gonna get started and he said oh I, I he said how i said to him how did you get started and he said uh, i was just gonna give it a year and do one video every week for a year yeah and he's got 125,000 subscribers, 128,000 subscribers now. Um, that's the strategy. One video a week for a year. If you do that, you will pick up subscribers. And it doesn't matter how many, really. That's kind of irrelevant. It's just the process of going through and creating a video every week for a year. Exactly the same as your podcast. Okay. You, you do that and you pick up, um, compa it's a compounding effect, right? There's a little bit of a difference, though, and this is one of the things that I both love and find difficult about the podcast. Let's just take these things as an example and about like our relationship to what we create and the people who listen, watch, interact. Like we're having this conversation now and a little bit of me is thinking about everybody listening and a little bit yeah. of me is just having a conversation with you and I'm not thinking about 
the how many thousands of people who were going to listen to it because that would throw me off my game yeah. in this context and I I love I kind of love knowing and also sometimes I'm quite frustrated that there isn't a feedback loop very much from the podcast yeah, you just no, have to trust true. that it reaches people and I know it does because I know when message me or people come in or they join the membership and they say I've been listening to you on the podcast and it's kind of in a way not the reason that we do it but it's it's a very different feedback loop than social media where we get we can build quite close friend. I've built amazing friendships through social media and that kind of regular, almost everyday connection. How does the feedback and the comments and that sense of community element happen in YouTube, or is that not part of it? Because I yeah, think so that's my, I think that's my block. If I'm honest, yeah. So you, so you can create a community. Yeah. There's a community tab that you get, and there is a feed, and there's a few other things like that that can help you. I, I think we we're kind of comparing um, apples and oranges, really, yeah. um, because it's what you want to get out of it. Imagine it's like um, doing local advertising in your local radio versus national radio. Like you know that the people that hear you on national radio, you're not going to see them in the street. But mm -hmm. on local radio, you might. Mm -hmm. so you might create better local connections, but the opportunity is bigger in the national scene and the na national, who who knows who might see and hear it. Podcasting is the same. You know, again, the, the you write about the feedback loop, but you're talking about two great marketing tools that have a bigger impact, but less closeness than yes. say Facebook, Instagram and TikTok because you can reply and you can become friends and DMs and all that kind of stuff. Whereas I think, think about these as big marketing tools that then drive people to those things. That's okay. how you get the closer. Okay. And I'm also trying to kind of put myself on the spot and think, you know, why do I have resistance to YouTube? Because I don't actually, I don't have a resistance to showing up on video I do that quite happily I don't have a resistance to sharing what I do but I'm just so I'm just trying to kind of peel back the layers because yeah. chances are if I'm feeling this I know other people will be as well and I think one of them is I think it's going to take too long yeah. and even as I say that I know that that doesn't have to be true am I worried about getting more critical comments a little yeah. bit maybe because there's some early videos that I have up that are still up on my channel that get that got some quite brutal comments in a way that has never happened on Instagram I'm just trying to work through my own objections you know yeah yeah so so in terms of effort it, it's as much effort as you want it to be so okay. at the start, imagine running your business right when you first get started it's hard it's a lot of effort you're wearing all the hats and anyone that wants to scale themselves in their business what you do, you don't end up doing more work the the bigger you get. You end up doing less work, but more strategically to the right yeah. thing. And usually that's income generating activities versus doing the the technical stuff in your business. So it's the same in YouTube. You start doing all of the things. Eventually you peel back right to someone designs my thumbnails, someone edits my videos, someone publishes my videos, and I just show up and do the 10, 15 minutes of talking to it. And that's it. So yeah. you, you, in terms of effort, that's the way it is. But the other thing to think about is the promotion of that stuff. So I teach a, a strategy of taking one, what I call a signature video, your, your YouTube assets, which is what it is, and then creating 49 pieces of content, 47 pieces of content, whatever, um, out of that one video. And if you did that every week with your one video a week, you'd have 2,500 pieces of content by the end of the year. Like that's, that strategy of doing that can take two to three hours a week, but you've got all of that content. So if you yeah. then take some of that and put it on Facebook, where you've got that um, engaged audience that really like what you're doing and you want to stay top of mind because you've got this, um, you know, you're not getting enough commissions for stuff and you'd see and there's other people in your network and you're seeing they're getting the commissions, but you know, your work's better than theirs, but they just seem to be more on the socials than you are. Like having one asset, a signature video that you have on your YouTube channel, which you then break down into smaller videos, can make you more visible just by yeah. having. And and like, again, 
if it feels like it's going to be a lot of work, it doesn't have to be a lot of work. It, um, you you said about um, taking an Instagram reel and putting it on TikTok, for example. There's a piece of software called Repurpose.io where you upload it once to TikTok, I think, and then it goes to Instagram Reels, it goes to YouTube Shorts, it goes multiple places. This, the interface of it's a bit pants. I, I really wish it was a better piece of software, but in terms of what it actually delivers, it just means you upload it once and it just gets sh shared around everywhere. You don't have to do anything. You have to set it up. It's just a mindset change, isn't it? I think, you know, from, you know, where is your go-to first position? You know, and what I'm, what I'm hearing you say is, you know, start with YouTube and then you can take take things out of that as your starting yeah. point um and yeah okay and this, is, All this right. is probably the hardest thing for me Alice because when people say I want to start YouTube why should I buy your course I'm like because of all of the things I'm not just showing you how to take a video and put it on YouTube we described earlier in this episode that it's a step-by-step -step and it's simple you can just go and do it now yeah. But what about all the strategic stuff that you need to do? How do we really save time? How do we make it easy? How do we get rid of those confidence things? Like that's the expertise that I have just in the same way as you with the work that you do. Anybody can come to you now. You've been doing it so long that you could answer any question that people give you and you can do it with confidence, you know. But I think also, again, we go back to this, this, the thing that we started the conversation with, like when you're starting something new, like you can either choose to like, figure it all out yourself yeah. the hard way she puts her hand in the air you know I kind of quite like doing that sometimes but also yeah, you know being honest there are times where you know you just don't have the capacity for that and like when you say you have one you know you have one YouTube and it creates 47 bits of content like my brain kind of goes blur but I'm imagining that you've got a system for that and you can like I can look at your system and go okay well making four pieces of content from that feels realistic for me now that, that's what we start with so yeah, that's yeah. where i'll start yeah so we so we and like it like i said with the videos if i said to you right at the start we're going to go and create an award-winning piece of video content yeah, it's yeah. Have five people working on it all that goes to you'd be like oh my god no way i'm not even going to go there but saying like get your mobile phone out between this time and next this week and next week you're going to create a piece of content it's two minutes it probably take you two hours to do that two minute video the first time mm -hmm. but eventually it gets quicker and quicker and so we have to start small so we go repurposing wise if we put it on youtube where else could we put it that long form or oh, we could put it in these places then what we can do we can split it into little things we can put it in these places and you just build on it each week my first 10 20 podcast episodes i edited myself mm -hmm. now my editor um takes them puts them on youtube for me she does all of the editing everything i just do that one thing but i had to do it myself first and, and understand the process so that i could pass it on to her to do and teach her how to do it yeah i'm thinking that there might be different people listening and different reasons for them starting to do this one that we've already spoken about is like your own record like your own record and enjoyment, and it could be a creative outlet that you really enjoy. I can imagine that there might be artists who want to show, teach, run workshops, share their practice. And what about the fact, what about artists who really, who don't necessarily, they don't want, they don't have, you know, paid offers, courses, workshops, that kind of thing, but they want to build an audience for their, for their artwork there's a place for that as well isn't there yeah yeah totally yeah well yeah. and they sell those products they they sell yeah. the the artwork yeah yeah oh, absolutely i mean i i straight away i can think of a number of people who i yeah. follow who i just love watching how they create art it, it's just it just blows my mind I, I think i talked to you when we did the guest expert thing like my wife has an idea and it's it's a finished idea in her head but she starts and i have no idea where she's going with it like to me that's fascinating and what I really like about artists is they will come up with creative ideas on how to create those videos that perhaps yeah. I wouldn't think of being technically creative in, in the way I describe my creativity is always technical. Um, whereas creative from a non-technical, it's really funny because I asked my wife the other day, I said, we were on a walk and I said, when you look at the world, do you see everything in numbers? And she said, no, <laughs> what are you talking about? She sees shapes. Yeah. And I see numbers. So when I'm walking, I, if I if I'm looking at the street and there's a car there, I see two wheels and I see two doors. 
everything is numbers to me. I'm looking for patterns of numbers all the time. Oh, she doesn't see anything like that. So, and I'm, I asked her that question because I was so interested in, in how our creativity comes together. For me, everything's symmetrical because I'm a numbers technical based creative. Um, I don't know where I was going with that, Alice. But that's oh. really, I mean, I've never heard anybody say that they see things in numbers. That's extraordinary. Yeah, yeah. We, well, just like I'm counting all the time. So, okay. So, I can't understand how people don't do that. Why would you not see like this five of think something instead of four? And this is the point. This is the point, though, is that what we do so naturally, we completely take for granted. Yes. And what what video and YouTube and what, you know, it just, it opens up, doesn't it? It just opens up the world and it gets social media. And, you know, there are things about it that I have problems with. But when I think about like what my life, career, experience, contacts, friendships would have been without all those different points of contact and what it's open up and what it makes possible, it's pretty exciting to have all that available. And I just wonder if this should, you know, this is just something, to, again, to explore um, that definitely people should have a go with. What I would love to know is um, I'm coming to your event. So it's in Birmingham. You said the first one. Yeah, it's May called... 23rd. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's called two. It's just one day, right? Yes. Yeah. It's one day with an after party. Yeah. <laughs> Who's going to be there? Like who should come? Uh, so it's really funny because somebody said they looked at my website. And it didn't really call out entrepreneurs. It was just creators and like, should you come if you're not a creator? And I was like, absolutely. Because what do you mean by two... a creator? So a creator. Oh, and the other thing is a lot of people don't identify as a creator. Right. So a creator, by definition, is someone that creates stuff. And in, in my definition of that for content is creating content. Okay. And, that, and you could create content in a number of ways, but you probably don't think you are. Even if you're creating written content in social media, you are a creator of something you're not a lurker you know a lot of people will just sit and watch your stuff but never comment never never create anything so if you are creating content you are a creator that's the definition and then we've got business owners so we've got a creator track and a business track and what i'm mm -hmm. trying to do is bring those two groups of people together because a lot of business owners are not creators a lot of creators are not business owners or they don't think the same and um also give people the choice to do one of the two things so so i'll give you an example there's a guy there called austin who has six hundred thousand subscribers which for most of us normal human beings it's that seems like massively out of the way like how could i get there but when you listen to austin speak he gives you a strategy and it is he says go and copy my strategy if you want to if you want to get to this point just go and do it now and do it every day and you're like oh Okay, that seems like it's possible for me. So I'm bringing people like Austin to give normal people like me, I could consider myself a normal person as well, the opportunity to be inspired, to be, um, to learn from people that are actually doing the stuff and getting great results from it. I've got someone called Sam who's, who's got like 10, 100 million views or something, something ridiculous. A, a guy called Justin who um, did a video every day for two years on YouTube, didn't work, just didn't work at all. He started unboxing his kids' toys and he's got 2 million subscribers and a billion views. Like it just changed by him changing the focus of what he was doing. Um, so so that's the kind of people. And then in terms of the audience, oh my God, I had a woman, well, I talked to you about Robin earlier, who's the the crochet woman who's got 780,000. Um, there's loads of people like that in the audience. You know, that the best thing for me is, bringing all those people to get together yes. robin said to me i'm she said i'm an introvert i don't really talk to any, anyone and i was like look robin this audience that i bring together are the most wonderful group of people they will swoop you up and you will feel totally at home with them yeah i mean i'm coming a because when i met you i just thought anything that you create and put together is going to be lovely you have a very good way i think you have a good way of making connections and uh, it, there is zero doubt in my mind that it is going to spark ideas and get me thinking about it in a new way and i am all up for that in yeah. every area of everything this year it, you know and particularly things happening in person that's why you know uh, by the time it, this goes out, it will have happened. It's why we've got an in-person event, because I think there's something really special about doing it 
about doing things in person. So what we're going to have is we're going to have a link. So wherever you're listening, there will be a link in the show notes. So tap on the notes, scroll up. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're listening in um, Spotify or in iPhone, whatever that podcast app is called in iPhone, it will be there. Um, if you want to come to TubeFest and if you want to find out more about Matt, maybe have a look at what courses he offers. Um, if you well, like can, I, can I tell you something? Yeah, Alex. go like, for it. I, 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 we're doing something new and I'm going to do it for the rest of the year. Yeah. And it'll be really, um, bad of me not to mention it. So we have a workshop that I do every two weeks. So it's on a yep. Friday. It's totally free. It's a planning workshop. So if you're sitting here after this and thinking, oh, you know what, I might give this YouTube thing a try. Yeah. Uh, if you go to kingofvideo.co.uk, um, I'm, I'm just literally today working on getting a little pop up that comes up, but it will it'll invite you to the workshop there. Nice. And um, you can just sign up. It's every two weeks. It will offer you the next two sessions. So you can book one of the one of the two. Um, and that's really my that's my big lead into everything now that I do. I want to show you the possibilities and then that way you can decide whether it's for you or not. I love that because that breaks doing something like that. Like it feels like a lower scale commitment. Yeah. Like you can get involved with it. It breaks down your blocks. You just get over that initial inertia hurdle. And then you're like, right, okay, I can do the first part. And then you're on to the, what might I need to know next? And yeah. Um, yeah, that sounds really great. Okay. Is there anything else that you want to add? I think we've kind of covered, I mean, we haven't gone into all the equipment and stuff like that, but to be honest, we can find that stuff out can't I mean I just honestly I just google on a well-known site and look for reviews for what I need yeah, I've got I've got guides for all of that stuff you know like okay. once you're in my world I, I again I've got loads of things that can help you get over all those little hurdles that come along as you get started all right lots of permission giving in this episode yeah yeah definitely I there, there was a, you asked about a book that I should um recommend it's called what to do when it's your turn and it's always your turn and it's by seth godin I it's not an audio but you can't you have to buy the physical part of it and it and in each page there's like a, a bit of inspiration on every page so you can open the book anywhere and there's a bit of inspiration for something which is why i love it it's all marketing based stuff uh, but one of the things in there it says um about um whether you do it or you don't do it it's still your fault <laughs> and i just love that and it's not about blame it's about personal responsibility and so yeah. I always think like so with the conference I have no skills in running a conference it seems like a stupid idea but I may as well give it a go right what's yeah. the worst that can happen I love that that thing of self-responsibility is I did we did a um, values exercise earlier in the year and that came out as one of my top three things and like you say it's not about right or wrong it's just about recognizing where you are in it like and owning yeah. it basically either I'm going to do it and have a go or I'm going to say no but I'm going to say no with knowledge like yeah or, or, or accepting the past no, not right now or whatever exactly yeah. exactly yeah bringing that into it uh if you want to have a listen you can we've had Seth Godin on the podcast so you are following okay. in Amazing. very very good footsteps so I think it was yeah. way back I think it was like episode 105 which feels like a long time ago but thank you for your time again um it's nice. lovely to talk about and you know maybe one of these days no last week's uh podcast is up on my youtube channel and i'm sure after tube fest maybe there will be a bit more good good <laughs> but i I've hope that this is kicking or screaming you, you you're getting on there alice <laughs> <laughs> I hope this has encouraged you to have a go if you're listening and um, we will see you again next week. And thank you for your time and sharing the podcast is always lovely when I see when we see you sharing it. So thanks so much for being here and we will see you again next week. Have a great week, everyone. Bye bye.